And I see that some questions have come up in our chat and we will get to those right now. David is here. Um, the first question is from Jerome. He's asking if you took systems engineering courses from another institution and or have a graduate certificate in systems engineering, can those courses be transferred for credit? Yeah, yeah so good question, Jerome. So uh, this is, um, this, and this is for every program, not just the systems engineering. So our, our transfer policy for Johns Hopkins University is it's a maximum of two courses that could be uh, transferred. Uh, and then the procedure is you send us either your trans or your uh, your course outline or your syllabus. Really, it's it's what's uh, what lectures or what material, what textbooks are are being available or, or had had been done in your class. And then our policies are to find the ins the JHU instructor uh, that that would be um, that would that you would think that would be applicable for. They review it and then they make the determination whether it's acceptable for transfer or not. Um, if it is, that's great. You can, you can um, carry that in. And it's like a 450 or $470 uh, transfer credit um, for each course there. Um, but then that does give you, it does give you that for uh, any ability. Um, and then if not, uh, if it doesn't match, then we let you, we let you know. Uh, and, and again, not every, not every course is going to, and, and from every school is going to be able to uh, to be applied, obviously, and that's and that's I think fairly standard for any any school with their um, transfer policies. All right, great, thanks for that, David. And guys, don't forget to put your questions in the Q and A. It's just easier for us to moderate if we're looking at one place because I see something in the chat. Just move right over to the Q and A, and we'll get it answered for you. The next question from Connie is what is the approximate cost for the program? And I will answer that question. And I was gonna just go right off of what I knew of last year's, but I should probably double check to ensure that the price has not increased because sometimes there are increases in costs. And so what we tell students is to budget um, $50,000 for tuition for all your courses. Um, and I will put a link. So it's about $4,755 per course. Um, and so I'll put a link to the tuition and aid page information in the chat so that you all have that at your fingertips. But it's about $50,000 is your budget, about $47,000. But if you're rounding up, um, then it's $50,000. The next question is from Eric. Um, are summer classes available for these courses? For instance, if I have to miss a spring or fall class, can I make it up in the summer? Uh, yes, yes. So, so classes are available um, pretty much every semester. It's it's basically it's based on uh, instructor availability. Uh, some instructors will, and especially with our core classes of the six that Ayana showed, um, those are available every semester: the spring, the fall, and the summer. Uh, there are certain certain electives, not many, but maybe more of the specialized electives where the instructor may be only available in the um, in the spring and the fall. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You can and you can take a pause for uh, a semester. Uh, you don't have to continually take uh, classes every semester. Um, for that. All right, great. Thanks for that. Um, the second part of Connie's question, the approximate cost for books and materials. I don't know that there is a set cost for books and materials. David, do you know? Um, yeah, so so on our course web pages and, um, and as you register, we'll have every, every instructor is required to have a textbook or textbooks, you know, if they're required, and that'll be on the on the website. Um, and so you can link to the Barnes and Noble website that we have, or you can just buy it off. Amazon or, or wherever else that you find it. Um, so we'll, we'll give you the textbook and the edition. Um, and sometimes the edition is important because because uh, some of those will change. Uh, generally, that's that's the only cost for um, for the class. And I don't believe that material wise, um, there are other costs like other programs may have other other costs like that. But generally for systems engineering, it's just the textbook, uh, you know, and they'll run from you know, 100 to 130 or so. And again, depending on whether you buy it used or new or from the different vendors. All right, great. The next question from Joe, 
I'm interested in a PhD in human systems engineering. Do you offer the PhD program? Um, As, go ahead. Uh, oh, go ahead. If you were going to, you're going to be able to answer. So, um, yes, we have a doctor of engineering program at Johns Hopkins uh, University. Um, it's not specifically for systems engineering. It's more kind of generalized for the engineering. Uh, and then, yeah, I think, I think we could probably put the link in the, uh, in the chat there. I'm doing that now. Um, so yes, we do offer the DN program, um, but as David mentioned, it's not, you, you make it fit what you want it to be. So it's not specific to any, um, I'll put it in the chat just so everyone has it. Um, so the next question, for a part-time student, will the program cost include just tuition only or are there other university fees that are applied outside of course material? Um, the only other fees that are applied is your graduation fee. Um, there, there are no other fee and that's $100. Outside of that, there are, there are no additional fees. Um, and Joe, I put the link to the DNG program in the chat so you can reference it there or anyone else who, who may be interested in that program. I saw a hand the, raised, but I don't see. And there's, and there's a couple of questions in the chat, and they're they're about the same. So one is about if you had a BS in finance, and the other one is if you don't have a GPA but you have a a, a more uh, more experience. So yeah, so we look at it, and I I do the admissions uh, decisions, and so we always say that this is a a whole person uh, approach to when we make decisions. Um, so yes, yeah, so what Ayana showed you were sort of like the the ideal candidates, you know, being a, uh, a you know a degree with STEM and above 3.0, and then as you're working in the systems engineering domain to be able to then apply your your uh, your, your skills and experience to the program. Um, so having that been said, uh, there's always there's always some uh, you know different. Uh, so, so we always look at you know everything that uh, that goes along with it. Um, so if you had the lane, if you had the BS in finance, but then you're also working in the systems engineering kind of domain, you know that's that can uh, that can tip it to uh, an admission an admit. Um, and, and also, you know, if you have a lower GPA, but then you've been working, uh, you know, for a lot longer, then that kind of balances out also. So generally, if you if you had just graduated from um, college and, you know, in the last year or so, you, you don't have that much on your resume. And so, again, your your um, your, your grades are going to be a little bit more weighted uh, than than your than your experience and vice versa. You know, if you had more experience in that would, would kind of balance that out. So again, we, we kind of look at all uh, all aspects of the uh, of the applicant first, and then you know kind of make the decisions on you know with, with um, if they'll be able to succeed in our program. Great, thank you for that. There is another question in the chat that I will read a lot. What did it go? Um, what if I don't have a three point? Oh, you kind of spoke to that. The whole list of yeah. questions. So. If you don't have a brief one, all what he just said applies as well. There's another question in the Q&A regarding the capstone project. Can this be something with your current employer? Are there guidelines as to what qualifies as a good capstone project? Is there a dollar threshold, et cetera? Is the project mentor someone from Johns Hopkins or is this someone from the employer? Okay. Yeah, so, so great to see that, Connie, to be able to look Look in the future. Um, so this is generally the last class that students will take at a capstone, and really, it's a an application of all of your system engineering skills that you've um, elected uh, throughout your program and applied to a uh, project of your choice. And so you work with your project mentor, and generally, this is the semester before you work with your project mentor, uh, and we have a list of project mentors. Um, so when you get there, you can see all their uh, bios and backgrounds and see what, uh, you know, who, who might you, um, you know, get along with, you know, best and, and then we'll, we'll work to be able to match you up with a mentor there. Uh, and then you pick your own projects and, and the mentor is there to be able to help shape your, shape your scope. So really it's a one semester project. Uh, and so um, timeline is important, expectations is important. Um, and then you as the system engineer, because you're the only one working on this on this project and there's no classes, there's no formal classes. 
uh, you build up your requirements, your architecture, your trade studies, uh, your test and evaluation plans, your risks, your schedule, you kind of track it like you were doing this um, sort of in the real world, but you're, you're, the, um, you're the office of one uh, doing this. And then, and then you pick your uh, project and your mentor will help you scope that to be able to, to get that done in a semester. We generally try to counsel students in terms of um, making this as a personal project or, or maybe like a hobby or something like that, you know, something that you're going to be looking at every day, you know, for about, you know, four, four to five months. Uh, so make sure you, you pick something that you like. Um, we try to discourage the, um, the actual business or employer kind of oriented projects uh, for a couple, couple of reasons. Uh, what, even though it's, it's, it's very convenient to go down the hall talk to your colleagues and use them as your stakeholders to be able to collect, uh, you know, something that's, uh, you know, good feedback. Generally, we've, we've seen a lot of, a lot of coworkers um, in good nature, try to answer and try to actually help solve the problem, um, which is not something that you want to, that you want to do. And then they'll, they'll go, um, they'll tend to go way into the weeds, way into the details, try to design this. Uh, and, and really what you want is, is more of a stakeholder kind of holistic approach. That having been said, uh, everything, it, it depends. Um, you know, if, if you really have uh, you know, your heart set on like an employer oriented part, you know, we, we can always work with you. But generally they're supposed to be, um, you know, unclassified, not proprietary, available for public release. And so again, if if you have some other employer related types of projects, again, we can we can work with you on that um, to be able to help shape that. So you're actually, uh, you know, again, having value potentially if you're looking for the employer. All right, thank you for that, Dave. Um, the next question from my list, I have a clarifying question regarding the requirement for experience in industry. Is that strictly to one full year of experience, no internships? even if the in internships were in systems engineering. For example, if I've had three previous internships with one company and will start my full-time employment this August, would I not meet this requirement? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Yeah, and we've, we've seen that recently. So, so generally we would say work experience would be like full-time, uh, not as an intern. Um, so if you had just graduated this May, uh, you know, two months ago, um, you know, would you be, would you be, you know, kind of available in the fall to, to you know, take classes? Uh, we would say probably, probably not. We would want you to have, um, you know, at, at least that six months to a year of, of real work experience. And this is, and this is why, um, because the materials, I think you'd probably have no problem, but uh, as it's oriented towards a lot of practitioner sort of expertise and, and knowledge, um, our, our goal here for the program is as you can take some class in some subject, you know, that you learn today and you could apply it tomorrow in the, uh, in your, um, in your workplace, um, you, you probably have to have that sort of, bound, um, that's a, to domain, uh, you know, knowledge and and a lot of our, our assignments are also oriented towards tell us about, you know, how this requirement, uh, you know, experience helped or didn't help, you know, in your own work experience. Tell us about how the architecting of the system. Tell us about how you've done some design or testing of that. So you know, now you can kind of hopefully see where I'm going. If you didn't have those kind of kind of like life experiences that you would potentially have as a as a full-time uh, employee um, that's that's where we're kind of headed towards that again it's it's um every case is a little different but that's that's where we're headed with the sort of the one year uh, experience and the reasoning why all right great the next question from Joe what is your take on future of systems engineering in the face of socio-technical systems? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's something absolutely that we would, uh, that we try to stay abreast of, uh, of all the, you know, the state of the practice, you know, again, all of our instructors are, you know, um, working professionals, um, just, just as well as all the students, 
Um, so again, we, we rely on our experiences. Uh, and so we can tell our C stories that are relevant in the workplace um, and, and not just the academic sort of perspective of here's what a requirement is, here's what a test is, but actually like here's what a requirement is. And we were just, uh, you know, just talking about this with one of our customers, you know, last year, last month, and this is how it went, or this is how it didn't go uh, well. Um, so yeah, I mean, future of systems engineering is always going to be uh, evolving, and that's we we um, and we've taken uh, steps. This is probably about an every year sort of basis to be able to look and evaluate our courses, uh, and then to be able to see what's what needs to be updated uh, and what new classes potentially could be. Uh, it could be needed. Uh, we we um, we just started our uh, model-based systems engineering course uh, a couple of years ago. It, in response to seeing a lot of this at at a lot of the conferences, uh, you know, and in a lot of the uh, the profession, um, that they're using a lot more model-based systems engineering tools. And so um, we decided to say, hey, this is this is time to be able to build um, some courses dedicated di directly at those tool sets to be able to then. Uh, help you, you know, in the in the field there to be able to uh, to use the tools and be familiar with them. And, and so those are those are a couple of electives uh, that we have in our our program. Great, great. Thank you for that. The next question from Connie: For admissions, do you require recommendation letters as well? If so, how many and how early are they needed to be submitted? Yeah, good question, Connie. Um, so it's it's not required if you uh, so it's optional. Um, if if you want to have uh, recommendation letters, um, yeah, by by all means. I mean, I, I read I read every every all the materials that come in, and so again with the re recommendation letters, you know, those come in, and I and I look at those as well. Uh, if you if you find yourself in a uh, in a in a position that you know, hey, maybe you didn't get as as good grades as you wanted, or you know, with some of the experience. Um, Adding letters of recommendation will always help to be able to say, "Hey, this is this is the reasoning, um, you know, sort of why." Or here's here's the you know, this is not indicative of you know the um, my current performance. And here's some other recommendation letters. So yeah, feel free to be able to uh, to add those. I think when you do your uh, your your admissions um, uh, application and your package, I think there is a a link or, or directions to be able to have your your folks um, write the recommendations. Um, so, you know, how early or when do they need to be submitted? Again, we're on rolling admissions. So kind of when when your materials come in, you know, that's when their materials should come in. So you should be able to dialogue with uh, with those folks and talk to them when uh, when your timeline looks. Um, and so so I will get this the package only when it's, you know, complete, you know, all the things that Ayana had said of, you know, what you need uh, for the application. And we have other folks that do this. So once that's complete, then they put it in the queue and then I, I go and review them. So um, yeah, hopefully about the same time that you put your, uh, put your letters in is when, when those should go in. All right, great, thank you for that. Lane is asking, how does the process work of changing from the certificate program to the master's program? Yeah, good question. So uh, it's just an email to uh, to us to be able to to say, here's here's what you want. I think you have the option, I think at the admissions time to be able to register or apply for the certificate versus the master's. Um, so we would say the certificate's really more more oriented towards if you already have a master's, and you're not wanting to go for an entire uh, second master's, you know, maybe this is the, maybe this is a way, I think it's five classes now, I think for the certificates. Um, and so, you know, that's half a master's uh, and, and you may find, you know, at that, at that point, Hey, you know, I'm liking what's going on. Uh, I'd like to be able to kind of continue on. Uh, yeah. That's just an email uh, to us to be able to, uh, uh, to, to modify that. If, if you get up to a point where, uh, you know, Ayana talked about um, it, app, uh, graduation, uh, you know, fees. And, and so, and so that's the point where you, you actually submit a form for intent to graduate. You fill out your information, you pay your fees. So if you're at the certificate level of that five, then you, then you can do that. And then you're, you're in the graduation uh, ceremony, like, you know, like my background here. 
Um, or if you're at the end of your master's program, um, that's just that's just a trigger for the registrar to be able to kind of look at your record, make sure your courses are all you know in line, and then puts you on the graduation list. But yeah, you can you can um, jump from the certificate to the master's, and conversely, uh, the same same uh, or the opposite direction. If you're doing your master's, and then you know life happens, something something happens, and you have enough credits for that certificate program and say, hey, I can't do this anymore. Can I get, you know, something, you know, for the effort if you meet those, um, if you meet those qualifications, then yeah, then you go back to the, the certificate. All right, great. Thanks for that clarification. Um, Jerome is asking, although a GRE isn't required for admission, are you still able to submit a score? How much of a factor would it be if set? Yeah, um, yeah, and that's that's one of the benefits of, of uh, Hopkins is that we do not require a, a GRE. So uh, you you can submit it, but I mean that will not you know really factor in our admissions decisions. I know other schools um, you know require that, and that may be some consideration, but not not for us. Right, not for the part time programs for the full time. Yes. Yeah. All right. The next question from Eric, on average, how much time should be budgeted per week if enrolled in only one class? Yeah, good question. So, um, so generally I think you use like the rule of three, three or four to one, so ratio. So if you have like a three credit class, like every credit of class time would translate to about three or so hours, you know, sort of outside. And that's and that's, uh, you know, so about nine or so hours, you know, over the week. And again, that would be also, you know, part of that time is also the lecture, the lecture time. And so if you were in a live course, that's about three hours a week, uh, you know, in all the, the textbook reading, the material, extra material reading uh, and assignments, discussions, quizzes. And so generally, you know, about that. So it's, it's, um, that's that's kind of a rough estimate. It, it, again, it depends on how much uh, how much expertise you have with the the subject. If it's something that you're very familiar with, uh, you know that you do in in kind of real life, then that may be a little less. And, and also, conversely, if it's a subject that you don't have much experience in, then um, yeah, maybe expect to uh, uh, to do a little bit more. Um, yeah, like Iana said, I was I was a graduate of the program, and one of the one of the classes I had taken was, um, you know, computer programming, and and I was not a I am not a professional software engineer, so that took that took a, a bit longer to uh, uh, to to be there. Um, kind, kind of probably related, if if others have the question about that, I get all the time is, uh, you know, how many classes are you taking? You know, one or two a semester. It also depends on the um, on the individual on what their timeline is. Uh, if if someone's really trying to trying to get through the program pretty quickly, uh, you know, taking two classes a semester, one in the one in the summer, uh, and then you know they can zip through it in you know two years. Uh, we have some military you know, active duty military um, you know students that you know that's their job, and depending what service that is, uh, you know that's like you know one to one to two or two and a half or maybe three years um, that they allow. Uh, and, and others, uh, it also may depend on your employer's, uh, you know, tuition assistance. You know, the, some some I know are capped. So when Ayana told you about that, you know, 47K, you know, kind of bogey for your program. Um, and about, you know, a good majority of our students have, have our tuition, their tuition paid by employees, uh, their employer. And so that may also have a factor in how many classes um, you can you can take there. Right, and I did put that information in the chat. Uh, admissions, if you click that page, it'll take you to all of your options for getting uh, your message to be paid for. Um, the next question from Connie, she's asking David, if it's possible for you to get an overview of the different concentration tracks and how they differ in terms of courses. and mm -hmm. the the second part of that is, are some of the courses pre-recorded or are they live online? Yeah, yeah, good question. So yeah, with the focus areas, as, as you can see there, um, these are these are groupings of classes that are, are, are logically sort of organized uh, in terms of what the um, what the courses are and, you know, for cybersecurity, human systems, modeling and simulation and so on. 
Um, you know, and again, those are those are some example courses that kind of fit together, like project management. We'll take we'll take that as an example. Um, you know, here are here are the different uh, you know classes that you could or that you could have. You know, in terms of uh, of management, um, if you looked at the technical management program, there's actually a lot more courses available. So don't think that you're limited just to these four classes, you know, in the project management electives. If you have others, you know, that are in the, in the, um, in that technical management program, by all means, you know, that's, that's also available uh, for you. So, so note that it's um, on your diploma, you don't get you get the Master of Systems Engineering, Master of Science in Systems Engineering. You don't have it with a focus area in cybersecurity or project management. You know, so there's there's nothing on there. So you could you could um, so it's a guide to be able to help you with your electives. Um, but yeah, you know, if you if you take a couple in project management, but then think, hey, I want to take another in cyber because it's of personal or professional interest. Yeah, by all means, uh, feel free to be able to. Uh, to kind of mix and match. Um, this may help you if you're if you're looking to uh, either either maybe transition or you know have have another position within your organization and you need some more uh, you know maybe domain ex experience um, in a project management you know position as an example. Yeah, it may it may behoove you to to take more of those classes within the uh, the project management focus. Area. So, but yeah, it's fairly fairly flexible there. Uh, and then you know, again, again, with your with your six core classes, and then either your uh, your one semester capstone or two semester thesis, that gives you only about two or three uh, electives to be able to choose what you'd like. Yeah. Great, thank you for that, Dave. And then she asked yeah. about the pre are the courses pre recorded or virtual? Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah, yeah, good, good question there. So for um, the majority of our classes, they're online, and so what that means is that uh, they are um, pre-recorded. So and and uh, and so think of like YouTube kind of kind of an approach to to videos. So so you have a module like in my class, there's a module, and it has for that you know one or two weeks, it has the uh, the lecture materials. Um, the readings, the textbooks, the you know chapters, uh, other supplemental readings, the uh, the quizzes, the discussions, and so those um, lecture materials were recorded. And so again, you kind of log in, um, and you can stream it or you can download it. It's it's like an MP4 video, and, and then you can watch it uh, as as much as you want. Uh, and then, um, which worked for when you know when when we were all traveling. Um, then that was that was convenient for the for the working professional to be able to download your materials. Hey, I'm going to watch, you know, because I've got a lot of uh, lecture materials and I've got a long flight, and so we're going to spend our time, uh, you know, watching uh, watching classes or or in the evening or whatnot. So, um, and then so for uh, for the virtual live uh, approach, it's it's similar to like the Zoom session. Um, so so that's that's at a set time so normally it's it's mondays through thursdays uh, about 4 30 to 7 is, is generally our classes if, if we had a lot more it would be like a 7 to 10 uh, p.m but again it's, it's kind of set up for the for the working professional so sort of after after working hours uh, and then you would have that live class and you would you know kind of remote in so if you weren't here in the in the local maryland area you know, where you would have classes, you know, live classes, you know, you would also have, uh, you know, on a screen, like a Zoom board, um, all the rest of the remote um, students there. But again, if you're in a different time zone, you may have to make, uh, you know, kind of adjustments for that. So that's, that's another option, the virtual live. And again, that's more for the students that, that need that uh, structure for, hey, I need, I need classes, you know, always on a Monday or Tuesday, you know, at a set time to then, you know, go there. Um, with the online ones, uh, it's on your own. So if you have the, if you have the self-discipline and structure to be able to, to log in and, and do your, do your, um, do your studies at a certain time, great. Um, others may need, 
may need a little bit more structure uh, for that. But it's the same, it's the same class materials uh, taught in both um, in both modalities. All right, great, thank you for that. Um, the next question, are we able to attend and participate in a normal graduation experience? Yes, yes you are. Um, all of the master's students graduate together and your diploma does not say engineering for professionals, it says Johns Hopkins University, Whiting School of Engineering. Um, and yes, you are able to walk across the stage with the other full-time master's students. Um, so there's no differentiation in the graduation experience. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question was the application deadline for spring 2022. Um, as David mentioned, there is open admissions. And so what we suggest for our admissions team is that you allow time, you, you pay attention. I have to look, I have to see what the actual beginning of the spring semester is, but I would backdate it about six weeks to allow time for them to make a decision and then give you the opportunity to register for the classes that you want to take. Um, so there's no hard, fast deadline, but I would allow six weeks from at least six weeks minimum um, from the time that you want to begin your semester. And there doesn't look to be any additional questions in the Q&A. If anyone has questions, you can send them right now. Yeah, I'm going to put the um, in the follow up. Uh, Anna, with your your just last uh, comment there, I'll put in the chat the um, the GHU uh, EP uh, academic calendar. And so again, the um, yes, we have rolling admissions. Um, there are certain points where registration will open for those uh, semesters there, uh, and so you you um, so again for the for the fall semester uh, registration opens up in two days from now, but even though we're not starting until August 30th uh, for the fall semester. But, you know, as you can see, you know, getting there, getting there earlier when registration opens um, allows you more options to be able to, uh, uh, to register for that. Uh, so so our, our, our procedure here is that uh, we're capped at 19 students per section. If there's more demand and there's more on the waiting list, then we just open up another section. Again, from an online perspective, that's very easy to uh, to then you know get another instructor, uh, you know, and sometimes it's the same instructor and then teach another another section. And so we've got a lot of uh, a lot of instructors to be able to do that there. Um, what gets tricky though is at the last minute. So you know, at, you know August thirtieth is the first day of class. If you know we we uh, you know you. You put your application in and it's you know approved on you know August 20th. Yeah, you know, that's that's still a little time to be able to register for courses. Um, but you know, they, they may be hitting the uh, the limits in terms of how many we can, and if there's not much on the wait list, you may have to uh, to, to kind of hold off until the next um, next semester. So that's the that link there is always a good one to be able to uh, to have for reference there. Yes, thank you for including that in the chat. Um, we do have some additional questions that have come into the Q&A. So the next one, do most of the courses involve group projects or are there assignments mostly individual? Yeah, it's a good question. So most of the core classes will have group projects um, and all of the classes will have some form of an individual um, um, assignment as well. Uh, and, and that's just the nature of systems engineering. It's a team sport, and so you'll see. Yes, with all of those six uh, six core classes, I think almost I think every one of them has some sort of uh, team efforts or team team projects uh, for that. In addition to the uh, to the assignments, uh, individual assignments also. And and again, as you can as you can imagine, uh, uh, you know your your classmates now that we're online they could be in different uh, different time zones uh, and so yeah you make it work just like just like in the real world uh, you know if you have colleagues in uh, you know different states and different time zones uh, or countries you you make that you make that work and you and you organize uh, your team. All right, great. And Connie's question: How is this, so I'm sorry? How is the certification offered through Johns Hopkins different from the inclusion certification? 
Yeah. So, so good question. So, so our certificate is that's that's you know five classes, the graduate certificate. Uh, the INCOSI certification, that's that's a separate, uh, so INCOSI, the International Council of Systems Engineering, um, that's, that's really the largest uh, systems engineering professional organization. Um, Johns Hopkins University is, is part of the, the corporate advisory board, uh, and then, um, you know, we're, we're heavily involved, as many other um, companies and, uh, and colleges and universities are as well. Um, and so that's a separate certification in terms of, uh, you know, the the expertise, uh, and it's a uh, it's it's a written test to be able to test your um, systems engineering knowledge and domain uh, domain knowledge, and then that's sort of within that that professional uh, sort of organization. That's that's kind of a different levels of certification in terms of knowledge and expertise and all that. So, so for our purposes, it's, it's two separate, uh, separate items. I know some, uh, universities, um, have had some arrangements where if you go through the whole program, that's, you know, kind of equivalent to, to, uh, um, an ASAP, um, it's an associate system engineering professional, uh, but um, but Johns Hopkins does not does not do that right now, um, like like some other universities. All right, that looks to be the last question. You all have like three seconds <laughs> if you want to ask any other questions of David this afternoon. All right. Well, since there are no additional questions, you all can feel free to shoot an email to the email address listed on your screen, jhep at jhu.edu if you have admissions questions, if you have questions specifically for our systems engineering team, they will make sure that it gets routed to them. Um, David, thank you very much. Andrew is also on the call. He's the chair of the department. Um, and so you all will be interacting with them at some point if you do decide to apply. Um, again, thank you, David. Do you have anything to add before we close out? No, looking looking forward to uh, for seeing you all. Um, you know, in the application cycle or or as a student in the class. So uh, yeah, feel free to be able to ask us any other questions. Um, you know, if you have them. Uh, I know, like after these sessions, uh, you know, some of the some of the folks with you know some of the experience or hey, my my program or my application may not be as the strongest. Can you can you take a quick look? Uh, and yeah, we'll be glad to glad to take a look at that and and give you some advice also. All right, thanks again for that, David. And we look forward to seeing you all in our virtual classroom. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye. All right, have a good one. We'll see you.